Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming to our, our Safe Routes Bexley Com Corridors Public Workshop. We had a different logo, so bike friendly Bexley there for a second. Um, really excited that you guys came out. Um, excited to talk to you about this concept of Com Corridors. Before we get started, I'm just kind of, oh, by the way, my, I'm Ben Kessler, mayor here with the city of Bexley. Pleased to meet, I think, I, I, I recognize all the faces in the story, but it's great to see you guys. Um, kind of gut check, who's feeling, this is kind of maybe cheesy, but who's feeling pretty good about talking about Com Corridors? Anybody feeling like a little uncertain, skeptical? It's okay, cool, okay, great, good, good. I'm feeling uncertain and skeptical, JK, that's not true. Um, so I wanna talk just real quickly about why we call this meeting and why we're here tonight. Um, and we're gonna be tag teaming with a couple of folks who have been helping out with our uh, our bike friendly Bexley uh, working groups, Eric Bjornyard, Craig Ness, Mark Subel. Um, about three, four, five months ago, we started uh, open sourcing our bike friendly um, internal staff meetings. So we've been working for the past year or two on a couple of concepts we're about to share. Uh, but then uh, these guys kept on like emailing and showing up and asking what was going on. And for updates, I said, you know what, let's just like have some open meetings and work on this together. And sort of in concert with that, maybe separately, uh, this idea for, as we've talked about, you know, bike lanes, traffic common infrastructure, pedestrian safety, enhancing grace, green spaces in Bexley and Bexley's just in general calm environment. Um, the, this, this imaginative idea came around about a calm corridor, about a calm corridor that stitches the school campuses of Bexley together. It's almost like a template for how we can work throughout our community. And I don't want to give away the whole plot. So Eric Bjornyard is going to talk about why we're talking about calm corridors. Yeah, so I mean, in, in a nutshell, uh, we've already got a very safe community for riding bikes and for walking, but we can do better. I mean, sadly, there's, I, I think many of us have stories of um, friends, friends, children who have been hit by cars. Uh, for me, this kind of started about eight months ago. I, I've always been interested in biking. I ride to work for the last, God, eight years. Um, but our neighbor's daughter was hit by a car that, that didn't stop at, um, uh, Remington. Remington and Denver. Yeah. And so thankfully she was okay. Um, but there are lots of examples like that. Uh, I think even within the last two weeks, um, Emily Kalush is here with her daughter and her daughter was hit by a car, um, going through an intersection right near St. Catharines. And so the point of this is how can we make our streets safer for cyclists? How can we make it safer for our kids to bike to school? But it's even bigger than that. It's how can we make it safer for pedestrians? I mean, there, there are a lot of pedestrian crossings where uh, we hear regularly, we had an open workshop a few weeks ago. Um, some citizens were here concerned that they see cars just running through the, uh, the crosswalks on Drexel. So how can we make it safer for our kids to get around Bexley? And then kind of in the process of that, that really kind of, kind of comes down to slowing and calming traffic. Um, and there are benefits to that. It's not just uh, now it's, it's more comfortable for kids to ride to school, but it's also quieter. If you live on those streets, um, it's nicer. Um, and uh, as you'll see with kind of some of the initiatives that we're talking about with Calm Corridor, a lot of the things that we're uh, hoping to implement aren't just going to slow traffic down a little bit uh, and make it safer, but they're also going to, like a lot of the projects that Ben's working on, it's going to make it like more beautiful, more green, uh, and and make Bexley just nicer in general. So that's that's the objective with Calm Corridors, um, or Calm Corridor. And with that, I will hand it back over to Ben, who can like give a little bit of background on how we got here. And Craig, I do have a, a switch. Oh, you got here. Yeah, sorry. But there was a great graphic a second ago. Oh no. Do we want to talk about the overview map or we can come back to that later? Um, we'll go back to that later. We've, we've carefully rehearsed this presentation, this discussion for this evening. Um, so I do want to talk about some current examples of in general, what we've been doing with infrastructure and backseat to calm traffic. Um, 
and you might have seen these started to pop up around the community. So look, for the past 12 years, of course, in my position, I've been dealing with concerns about safety throughout the community from a variety of perspectives, whether it's um, pedestrian safety, road safety, safety of people in their yards, um, and, and generally just the conflict that we have with vehicles and the, the quality of life in Bexley. So, um, you know, most people call and they say, hey, it's really unsafe on my street. Can we have some speed bumps? Uh, that's the default is asking for speed bumps. Um, and you might have noticed we don't put out a whole lot of speed bumps. And there's a really good reason for that. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm happy to talk to you about it later. Um, and so we've done other things. We've done active speed signs. We have done, you know, extra police patrol. Um, but the most potent and powerful way that we can really inform the calm, calm interface with our neighborhoods is with infrastructure. Um, you can put up a speed sign all day long that says drive 10 miles an hour and guess what? People aren't going to drive 10 miles an hour. In fact, I was in a class at a school that I will not name today. This was, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, talking to some students, who I will also not name, whole classroom full, uh, recent drivers, and we were talking about city policy in general, and they were saying, hey, can we, um, can we kick up the speed on Cassidy to 35? Because like everybody drives 35 on Cassidy, so can we just raise the speed limit? And I like looked at them dumbfounded because I was like, Nobody has ever proposed raising the speed limit backs as ever. And I said to him, I'm so glad you shared that with me. That tells me that we need to further bolster our infrastructure on Cassidy so you don't feel like going 35, uh, which is exactly what a lot of our focus has been with traffic calming. So this is an example recently where we had residents on Roosevelt concerned about speed on their street. And um, we did a speed survey and we did find that this section was higher than normal uh, speed for secondary street. And we also had the opportunity um, to be able to put in a bump at a relatively at a relative ease, just because of the way that storm sewer works on this section of Roosevelt Avenue. I don't have the final data yet on how much it's calmed traffic. I have the uh, subjective currently data, which is every time I pull up to it, not even remembering it's there, it feels like I want to go slower. This is South Roosevelt, just south of Broad Street, so it's mid block between Powell and Broad Street. It also created a crossing point near the alley. Um, we're working on a similar concept on Drexel that's far more robust than what we see on Roosevelt. So you've started to see these bump outs go in. This is on the east side of the street. You're going to see mirror bump outs relatively on the west side of the street and medians and areas, again, just designed to really calm traffic, slow down speed with a goal to bring the speed on Drexel down to 25 miles per hour. Um, this is an example of a pedestrian specific bump out on Drexel. Um, there's some really nerdy infrastructure stuff happening right there with with uh, storm sewers and drainage that I'm pretty excited about because if this works, this is the first time we've tried what's going on here with the grates behind us, we'll be able to easily deploy these throughout the city with relatively low cost and uh, with, with a fair amount of speed. Um, and then some recent medians that we've added to uh, Bellwood. Sadly, those boxwoods did not survive the winter, so we're gonna have to replant some of those. But um, again, designed to kind of draw attention to the fact that there's an inter intersection coming up and traffic can slow. So these are some, some of the physical infrastructure that we've been putting into place. In the meantime, we're starting to deploy components of the bike-friendly Bexley plan, which was passed by council a couple of years ago. Um, we've been hard at work with our bike boulevards. So there will be bike boulevards designated through Bexley North, South and East, West um, with wayfinding signage, um, special street signage along those boulevard routes, and then road markings. And these are designated for streets that are already viewed to be pretty safe for cyclists to share traffic with, uh, with vehicles, where calmer streets, a little bit more space for everybody, and so a bike boulevard designation was felt to be appropriate. So those, that's kind of some of the context about what we're working on going into the calm corridor discussion. And with that, I'm turning this over to, is it Mark or Eric? <laughs> I have Eric overview of Com Quarters concept, but I think you did that. Yeah, well, I guess one thing I'll add really quick uh, as, as Mark dives into the examples is the concept that we're looking at or the concept that we're looking at. Eric, I'm gonna have you speak with the mic because we're recording this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So really quick, the, the concepts here, the idea is 
in general, these are things that we can easily implement. They're not super expensive. They don't take a ton of time in engineering. Um, two, they're not just for kids. Like these are going to improve the streets for pedestrians. They're going to improve streets for you know multi modes of transportation, scooters even. Um, they will be aesthetic improvements. And then one of the keys here is the things that we plan to implement on the Calm Corridor are um, like vehicles that we could implement throughout Bexley as we prove that, hey, this does make the Calm Corridor nicer and quieter and safer. And we have data that shows that cars are driving slower and kids are feeling safer and there's more bicycle traffic. And so the idea here is that Calm Corridor is also going to be a testing ground uh, and, and a proving ground for these initiatives that, that we can expand throughout Bexley to continue making Bexley safer and more friendly for pedestrian cyclists and all of that. Now, Mark. <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk about the tactics you can use to calm traffic. Now, these are all going to be things that urban planners have used for years that are proven to help calm traffic, both for pedestrians and cyclists and even in cars as well. So a tabletop intersection, you may have seen these where they're slightly raised in the center or as you come to the intersection. So what these do for pedestrians and bicyclists is it makes it known that there are going to be people crossing here. It makes motorists slow down because they know they're going to have a slight incline as they go through the intersection. Also, this one, this is a, a concept by, I'm not sure what the national organization is, but they've put bollards along the, the turns there to make it, you know, people can't, you know, turn right on top of the sidewalk, that type of thing. Also, they'll be enhanced with um, crosswalks and things like that. So a tabletop intersection is typically like a, a major intersection where you want to slow traffic, um, you know, with a lot of pedestrians, maybe some major infrastructure or institution schools and things like that. Enhanced intersections, these are, if you notice, anything that can help narrow the road will help slow traffic and make it safer for pedestrians. So an enhanced intersection, you can see there are the bump out concepts that Ben mentioned, but also then, um, you know, you can put plants there, foliage, things like that on the corners, enhanced crosswalks that are large. This again, makes it better for pedestrians, cyclists, slows the traffic as it gets through the intersection and as they make turns. Uh, bump outs, you can see these concepts, uh, you know, this here on the right is one where you can actually put, you know, like plants and, and, and nice things. So it enhances the beauty of the intersection in addition to calming the traffic. Bump outs narrow the turning radius. So as a motorist, you can't, you know, if it's a wider turn, you'll go faster naturally. When it's a narrower turn like this, and a, a narrower turning radius, radius, you're going to go slower naturally. Again, you're narrowing the road. This is something we see more increasingly also in schools and things like that, where you can cross not only, you know, across and, but you can cross diagonally as well. And this is in tandem with uh, lights at the intersections that would be red for all directions. So then people can cross and obviously it brings a lot of attention to the intersection and is, you know, as a motorist, you take notice, you stop and you wait. So this might be a concept you might use at a major intersection at a school, especially during, you know, as kids are going to and from school. This is more bike centric, but it also helps with narrowing the road. Once again, narrowing the road by having the bike lanes and the, the turn bike boxes that helps get the cyclist ahead of the traffic. So the, the motorist sees the uh, cyclist. It's kind of akin to if you are walking around Bexley and you're trying to cross the street, You've noticed that all the crosswalks now, there's a five second interval where it goes to where pedestrians can walk. Same concept here with the bicyclists. It makes it safer for pedestrians to cross because motorists have to wait and they see the pedestrians and bicyclists go out first. Bike lanes and multimodal lanes. This is not just for bikes. It could be scooters. It could be the scooters you see people riding. Um, these, again, if you look at the dimensions here, it actually narrows the road for motorists. And when the road is more narrow, you're going to go slower as a motorist. But it's also safer for a dedicated lane for cyclists to get uh, to and from safely. And Ben just showed the concept of the mid-block mid crosswalk. 
again, as a motorist, you take notice of this infrastructure in the middle of the road. It's also safer for a pedestrian to cross. And here's that concept again on Roosevelt, where you have that mid-block crosswalk, which has slowed traffic down anecdotally. Creative crosswalks. Now, if you're a motorist and you see a crosswalk that's white, you're not going to think anything of it. You're kind of like blind to those. But if you see something with more color, something maybe a different shape, you know, some different designs, you're going to take notice. And so it's going to slow traffic down. It's going to make it safer for people to cross. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, first, sorry for your the issue. That's horrible. <laughs> Second of all, yeah, I, I mean, that's just an evil person, right? Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can't say that these work in any sort of, you know, but yeah, no, that's unfortunate. That's horrible. Incidentally, I talked to the, um, uh, the, the I'm not, what is it, Andy? Let's see. Service director. Service director for City of Bexley. And he has it on his task list to at least enhance the white lines that border it because we know that that paint has faded. Right, so that's the concept of, as a cyclist, unfortunately, if there is no infrastructure for cyclists, you have to, in order to be safe, you actually have to take the lane, which means you have to be in the center of the lane. And nine out of 10 people do not like to do that. So your options are, oh, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. all right, we'll keep, last, last concept here. Okay, I'm done here. <laughs> A signage, I guess you, you talked about that at least, I guess. Is it? There'll be signage along some of the, the, the calm corridor routes for cyclists, so. And then the idea of like with the calm corridor is all of these different tactics are kind of strung together. So that feels like a place where you're gonna encounter bicycles, you're gonna see pedestrians, you're gonna drive slower. All right, who's up next? Thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Craig Ness. I am a Bexley resident for the past six years. I am a bike commuter and I have a family who commutes to school every day by bike and scooter. Um, so we wanna make sure that we have enough time for us to talk about some of these concepts. But before we do, I wanted to run through as a group, some of the places that we think are key intersections or key parts of this corridor where we might add some of these things from the toolkit that Mark just went over. Um, so I will run through them, uh, and then there'll be time for a discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, as Ben mentioned up front, this is something we want to use up front to connect the schools. Um, so starting in North Bexley, we saw a couple opportunities at intersections near Maryland Elementary School, uh, one of which is Castingham in Maryland. Um, from observations and from people we've spoken to, this is an intersection that has a lot of pedestrians and cyclists crossing. This is a place where we could consider the tabletop intersection that Mark mentioned. Um, if we had something that was raised or elevated here, that would add more visibility and emphasis that there are pedestrians and people crossing the road here. Um, and it would uh, give vehicular traffic more notice of other people using the road. Another intersection nearby is the one uh, at Maryland and Remington. In this case, what's different about this intersection is we do have um, walk signals and a traffic light. Uh, so not only could we consider that raised intersection here, but we could also consider the scramble intersection. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to upload it later. It's not live stream. It's recording. But I was sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, thank you. Okay. Message from home. Thank you. Um, this is also a place that we, since there's a signal here <clears throat> and a stoplight, we could do the scramble intersection, um, also known as a pedestrian scramble. Uh, in this case, as Mark mentioned, the lights would all be red at once. And so all vehicular traffic would be paused. Uh, and in this case, the people who are crossing would not have to worry about which direction they're going. They could rock diagonally or any direction here uh, without worrying about someone turning or going across and running the light. Uh, along the same lines, the intersection of Elm and Cassingham, this is very close to the elementary portion of the Cassingham School. Uh, this is another place where there is a signal uh, as well as a busy intersection, so we could consider that tabletop design uh, as well as the scramble. Yeah. All right, are we, are we good? We're live, okay. live to the nation. Okay, um, a few more to run through. Uh, so this is Elman Cassingham, close to the main campus of the Bexley High School and the Central Schools. Uh, next is Remington and Maine. Um, this is uh, an interesting intersection. And it's a bit tricky. And I, we've had a lot of feedback from people uh, at this intersection and also at Maine and Cassingham, which we'll get to. But the thing that's unique here uh, is that if you are crossing and trying to go straight from south to central or, or vice versa, uh, the intersection has a bit of an S curve in it. Um, so that can get a bit confusing uh, for cars and pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, in this case, this might benefit from having all of the, the lights uh, turn to red at once um, so that people who are crossing can do so safely and, and feel safer as they're traveling through. Uh, so this one is very close to the Montrose Elementary School. Uh, it also provides a gateway to South Bexley and to Central. Uh, we've talked a couple times already tonight about the mid-block bump outs. Uh, this is the one that's already installed in Roosevelt. Um, but we could pepper these in some key places uh, along South Cassingham and North Cassingham uh, along this corridor. Uh, this gives the advantage of an extended curb. Uh, if there were cars that are parked near that extended curb, or if it wasn't extended, uh, if you are a pedestrian, you don't have as much visibility. Uh, but if it's sticking out, uh, motorized vehicles have a better chance of seeing you if you're standing closer to the road this way. Uh, next, this is an, uh, an idea and a concept for uh, a cycling infrastructure improvement between Fair and Sherwood. Um, we've done some observations uh, that a lot of uh, foot and bicycle traffic happens uh, to and from school on Cassingham between Maine and Fair or between Sherwood and Fair. Uh, we feel like this is an opportunity to consider a dedicated bike lane. Uh, in this case, it could travel bi-directionally and there could be a lane on either side. Uh, we've measured this road. It's wide enough to accommodate vehicular traffic as well as bicycle traffic. Um, and it could happen on both sides and we could do some bike infrastructure here. Uh, we would have to talk about the, um, the cars that utilize parking that are close to fare, but for the most part, the majority of this uh, street is not utilized for car parking. Uh, lastly, this one uh, is also another one of those tricky intersections where if you're crossing across, uh, if you want to stay on Castingham, you have to jog over. Uh, we're still examining this. Welcome to anyone who has an idea about this, because uh, it's a tricky one. Definitely heard about some close calls or some actual uh, times when pedestrians have been struck in this intersection. Um, so it's an important one, but it also involves a lot of factors with the businesses and Main Street and the fact that you have to jog over. Okay, turn it back over to Ben, thanks. All right, so we're actually not gonna do next steps yet. That's a very, that's a, just a misleading slide. Ignore that slide for a second. 
We're actually going to talk about any questions that people have and just open it up to general brainstorm about what we've talked about. I do want to, a couple of things popped into my head as we were sitting here. First off, we we're talking about uh, current infrastructure. I did not mention that um, on Common in Commonwealth Park on Columbia, we're going to have kind of the mother of all road diet projects where we're going to take a lot of what was talked about here, narrow the street, but that it will have a tabletop crosswalk. So some of the mid-block crosswalk illustrations that you just saw were tabletop crosswalks that actually be created the sidewalk. And I'm going to pass around this book for other fellow infrastructure nerds to just read through the map around. That's the National Association of something, something, something that uh, creates a lot of the exhibits and concepts that we're talking about tonight. Um, and the other thing is, I think um, just uh, a question was kind of briefly talked about, what about when you narrow the street, you're really sort of setting up a conflict between cyclists and pedestrian safety. And that's something we've talked about a lot um, because there is a, a sense in which if a cyclist is not comfortable sharing the road with a, with a, with a car, that you are sort of choosing, are you highlighting pedestrian safety at crosswalks and in general throughout the city with slow or calmer traffic, or are you highlighting cyclist safety? And I'll say that it's it's a tough question because sometimes it, you do have to choose. Are you highlighting one or the other? A. B. Bexley's unique. Um, and it's a sense, I mean, we are and we aren't, but we are unique in terms of just our exact neighborhood fabric. And we're doing a lot of these projects and we're studying and we're learning. So for example, we're doing this Drexel traffic calming project. We're gonna be watching very closely how that impacts cyclists, how that impacts traffic. Um, we're investing in this, but infrastructure is as much as it seems fluid. I mean, <laughs> I've already seen projects that are now 15 or 20 years old that we're like looking at again, how we're gonna do this next. So we're constantly learning and evolving through that thought process. Um, and there are places where we would wanna highlight bike, bike infrastructure, bike safety, and other places where we wanna highlight pedestrian safety. And ultimately, if traffic is calmer, um, then bikes are ultimately safer because in general, it's a calmer environment for safe cycling. And the last thing I don't think we really highlighted a whole lot is, I think the vision is that this calm corridor would also be a bike boulevard. So we would have some of that additional marking, some additional enhancements that would really suggest that it's a shared roadway throughout. And having that, if you guys want to kind of, everyone who presented, step up with me and help me uh, navigate any of the questions ideas, thoughts that we, thoughts that you guys might have. Alex. So I, I can speak to the Burns thing and then see what that does not have to block where I live. And I know this is probably for Burnmark, but on the Broad Street side, but in those areas, you're dealing with higher speeds to be, you know, make it over there. Um, is it something that can be done efficiently for pedestrian safety in general? Because of the severity of the cars that seem to be throughout the city, compared to like the ones that are locally around the city, you only imagine that there's a either greater risk for safety in the one thing drive that is not necessarily as easy to get in the street. So, like, people go faster on these drives than they're going on other streets. But what can be done to help reduce the so somebody alluded to one of the changes we've made in the past couple of years is where we've created almost like mini scrambles where there's a five second lead time for pedestrians at all those crosswalks and we study the routes to understand like where especially with pedestrians and we'll get into cyclists a little bit more but with pedestrians where is like the route that if i'm a parent i'm going to say to my kids hey cross at this crosswalk and so the main crosswalk is Cassingham in Maine, at, or just right in front of the CVS, where there's a median in one section. Um, traffic turning southbound isn't is, is either choosing a right or a left turn, so that you don't have the, quite the same amount of through traffic. It's basically like a three-way intersection as opposed to a four-way. So for pedestrians, that was one of the first intersections to get the lead time. It has some additional signage on it, and it's designed to really enhance that crosswalk to go north from South Bexley. At Broad and Cassidy, we have similar changes although we have some turn restrictions because it's a four-way intersection and we added flags that don't really ever get used but in case anyone ever wanted to use them there are flags that students could use um, and we're constantly studying those inter intersections from pedestrian perspective so we'll 
we have center medians and broad, but the medians are placed where there aren't turn motions into properties. So we have to be careful about where we put them. They can't, they are currently optimized. Like as curb cuts get eliminated and we have more options down the road, we would love to expand the medians, but they're kind of where they can be on main and broad. Do you guys have anything to add about? Well, I mean, do you want to, I think you could speak more than I could on this, but we did talk about bump outs in those intersections, but you brought up the challenge of the bus routes going through there too and how those are in conflict. Right. Yeah, so uh, right now we have peak restrictions on parking on Main Street, which means when it's rush hour, you can't park on Main Street, as you guys know. Hopefully no one's ever gotten towed, but that, that does happen. I shouldn't bring that up. Um, so would I love to have bump outs on Main Street 100%, like what Short North just recently did, where it's sheltered parking, it narrows the street, it slows traffic. The problem is, um, even at 3 o'clock, when that restriction is out of place, we start to get a huge backup on Main Street of traffic coming through. Add to that the fact that Central Ohio is exploring bus rapid transit. That bus rapid transit will need a dedicated lane. So we don't want Main Street to turn into like a super wide thoroughfare. It would frankly destroy Main Street. So how we, we need to be careful about preserving the lanes of travel we have and then solving some of that through policy. And parked cars can be some of our best friends with that because parked cars do calm down, slow down traffic. Um, and and are an excellent solution to slowing down traffic when we have wider roads, sometimes. So about medians, like on Sherwood, there's like, so traffic was a nightmare on Sherwood because they couldn't you know, put any median there. And it's much heavier now than it was before the medians because they keep the road kind of the way they back up. So now it's made my road so pretty much safe for right? Mm. So yeah, please don't let me be the mother. And when you think about Broad Street, think about the, you know, there is no parallel street to the center of that street, but they did throw a lot of people over on the city street. So they have to take that to avoid Broad Street. That's funny you mentioned that because I live on, have a street. I live on Remington, so one block east of Cassington. So um, all of this traffic calming theoretically it makes my my street a nicer street to drive up and down if Cassington becomes a quieter street. Um, but I think ultimately, if we can make Cassington more calm, that that more south corridor, then we create one safe, like really ultra safe space for pedestrians and cyclists. But you're right; what we do on one street affects neighboring streets. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Sherwood might be a good idea for maybe to bump out too. The kids are crossing at Remington. They can keep one at Remington, but if they want to go over to Cassidy to go that way, if they don't want to cross that and get that here. Yeah, we should almost put the map up. Yeah, right. yeah then we So, so actually, the, the, the big map, map between uh, them. That you know, symbol matter now is uh, it's this north south corridor, but once you get to Sherwood, because the crossing at Cassingham and uh, Maine is so funky and confusing, the idea is then once you get to Sherwood, you jump over and then Remington becomes the north south at that point. But also, we're quickly piggyback that not only is Cassingham a little clunky, but Remington borders Montrose, so Cassingham doesn't. So and there's a signal there, so it's the it's the best road to cross that will also connect to the other elementary school that I thought bringing up earlier you would take the curve out of Yeah, and I also think it has to do with how far east or west you are in the south, obviously. Um, I would, as a parent, and I know your kids are going to want to do it, I would, because it's a three-way intersection at Maine and Cassingham, and we, on the east crosswalk, we just have a safer condition there, I would, I would encourage them to take that, that leg. Again, they might not want to, <laughs> but it's, it doesn't have... So the Rem currently the Remington in Maine has a little bit more complication with some of the left hand turn and some of the stuff that's going on. That's some of what we're trying to hopefully solve. Alex. That, 
I know you mentioned the spot about taking that um, white line out. But is it possible to get an entire? I know we can't do the newsprint and the blue, but like a solid walking segment area alley and bike alley. I feel like that helps with cars having a dedicated visual compared to bikes and kids. If they're going to cut down an alley, it takes some time for them to be able to burn across from it. Because I do agree, I mean, one, I, I feel like most of them are better than the United States recommend on this street. But I think it's based on where you live. Yeah. If you want to kind of steer that traffic, so we did repaint them. Yeah. Recently. Um, so the white line is now uh, thermoplastic. I always call it elastomeric, but thermoplastic. Yeah, I mean the, the thermoplastic, the and the thick line is now that will last a lot longer. The creative paint and stuff that was like more of a not as long lasting. <laughs> Yeah, we'll continue to maintain it. The the thermoplastic is long is a lot longer lasting, so yeah. it won't need to be repainted all the time. And that's the most important, I think, line. Um, and I'm, you know, if you want to add moose tracks, go for it. I mean, <laughs> nothing against it. And I wanted to comment a little bit on the. Long day. It was a little hot. I remember. Well, you know, we got a little bit of a, uh, which I had this frankly, is not a huge concern, but OD, ODOT sent us a letter, a couple letters, actually, about the colored crosswalks because they don't comply with Ohio uh, traffic manual. Um, they're real cross, they are real crosswalks, and I wish that I had been there when you had that confrontation. Because <laughs> I would have had some good words from that motorist. And by the way, speaking to the, like, the look and feel of the crosswalks, like, I think all of these tactics have an opportunity to improve the aesthetics of that, that street, that intersection. And so crosswalks, there are lots of different ways that we can approach that with like just beautiful thermoplastic options out there. So they can be wider, they can be green and white and look classy and, and who knows, maybe we develop our own like Bexley brand template of crosswalks. Yeah. Right. Um, what is interesting, just while we're nerding it up in infrastructure, thermoplastic is way more expensive than you would think. We we got a quote to make the pride crosswalk permanent at the library, and it was like eight thousand um, dollars. Actually, bump outs with curbs if there's no drainage needed are less expensive than thermoplastic. Alex, is there any time like a portal in like dedicated bike lane? Like in Bexley or in, in, in throughout? We don't currently have a dedicated bike lane in Bexley. Okay. We have there's nothing, there's nothing to study at the moment. We have several quarters we're studying right now for bike lanes, yeah. but there's nothing currently that we can point to. Okay. And most of the examples regionally for bike lanes, and you guys chime in about this, but a lot of them are on like busier streets. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, Summit. So they're not exactly analogous to some of what we're looking at. But. Yeah, I mean, hopefully this, if there is appetite for testing one, then We'll have before and after data to prove the model, right? So, one last thought about it. I think um, Remington is a crossing, totally understand. And as a parent, I also know that there's only so much I can tell my kids to do as opposed to they would do. Um, Cassingham, one of the things that's really compelling about Cassingham for bike lanes is it is the wider street, it can physically fit. By doing so, you will visually narrow that street. Uh, there's not a lot of every house that's on it has alternate parking. Um, either right in front of their house or nearby because they're corner homes. And um, and and when when as you drive that route in the morning, like it is just flooded with student cyclists. It is a super busy cycling street. Remington does not have the physical space that Cassingham has for that sort of a solution. We looked at a lot of different ways how to handle that. And yeah. I would love to hear from anyone who lives on Remington. Yes. <laughs> so so I talked to email about corridors or your this and I've honestly been thinking about it since I went to Las Vegas, and I've become like really passionate about it. And so I don't, so if you were to put outside in and you consider Cassidy and Roosevelt as the main two way streets of the right? And then you come in each to, you know, Cassidy and Remington, 
I still kind of like go to bat that Remington is just as busy as Jackson is, and you have Butcher and instead of kids, like I I wake up every day after school for my kids to my dog because the aftercare kids that route they take. Maybe they should be walking down to Remington, but they don't. Every day they walk down Remington. Is that Remington from um, Catholic, from Catholic yeah, Elementary? The aftercare okay. kids walk down to Monsher and they love seeing my dog and so we say hi. But it's, um, I honestly would love, and I don't know if you guys would be okay, but considering like traffic directions as well, because it would be wide enough if you made Remington a one way north. Yeah. Passing him a one way step. You can honestly have a quick little step if parents would eventually know if it's raining. Okay, I'm going to go up this way and come down that way. Like, I don't know if one way streets are something that Jackson would consider, but if it was a one way, you could have a designated bike lane and you could even possibly widen the sidewalk if you wanted to. Um, I know my neighbors go to this and they're like, look at the sidewalk, but go to the school and have a flat. Um, so you're really here to get their bushes trimmed. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> well, I have a quarter house, a quarter house right in Remington, and that sidewalk, you know, I yeah. would, I would honestly love if you guys would trim it out, widen it, and make it a one-way street. I'm here for it. <laughs> so uh, we so, looked at that. I yeah. mean, that Remington and Cassian was like this yeah. back and forth of like. What can you do? I think there were some limitations on Remington, right? The chat, what the re, the reason Remington is how it is is for reasons. It's not it's it's that the right of way stops where the sidewalk is, edge is, edges, and the sidewalk today is not conforming with ADA. So what that means is there's not enough room to get past those driveway aprons. So the sidewalk does this the whole time, right. which is not a good sidewalk. It also gets snowed in when the plows come down the street. Um, if you were to make it one way, the concern we've had with one way traffic, and we're open to everything, like we're fun, right? So we'll look at everything. <laughs> but uh, one way traffic increases speeds. That's the big negative. So if you don't have conflicting tra traffic to mess with or to think through as a, as a, as a driver, one way traffic will, will just make you feel better about being fast. And that's why we've, there are all sorts of really interesting options for one way around the campus, especially like what you could do with one way. But the thing that scares us is how cities are actually getting away from it because of the speed conditions on one-way streets. Having said that, if we really wanted to go crazy on Remington, this might be a real non-starter, but what if Remington were a pedestrian bicycle alley where it was not open to vehicular traffic other than pedestrians or bikes? And we'd have to figure out the alleys a little bit with that interface. As they, they dump in, it might turn out that those alleys can't interface with Remington either. Um, but and that could complicate city services. But <laughs> that's all the sort of thing. Like I'm, I think it would be those are sorts of things that are really interesting to study. Is like if we really looked at this a different way, does Remington carry critical vehicular traffic north of Sherwood? I I don't know. One of the things we are studying as part of this conversation is exactly how many bikes and pedestrians are on Remington and on Cassian. That's important data to help think through this. Yeah, we're just talking about main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to <laughs> piggyback the and Maine Fair specifically is where that condition exists. I don't mean, so to I do that. but that's where that narrow right of way. Yeah, yeah, it's just a challenge because of limited infrastructure. Just one other thing about Remington that I've noticed, piggyback on Libby's comment, is there I have observed a lot of people using that route as well. And I think also part of the reason is people, students can go in on both sides of the school, it's not all entries on Cassingham. Yeah. There's also entrances in the back right. um, for the high school and elementary. So I think that raises the amount of people that use it as well. Do those tabletop intersections, can they sneak through a red gate? Uh, clockwork. Like a yellow clockwork. Yeah. Like that, would really... that would be ideal. Yeah. And like if you're low vision, you can't see very well. And mm -hmm. I see people low vision and watch your face. That kind of box like this that Angle or really curtain box, but nothing is just raised. You know, these sort of like a sidewalk. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, they're often painted yellow. Yeah, yeah. But I think, oh, just just to add on that, like, so again, with the calm corridor, the idea is that we're able to test. That's something that we could test at, at one of these intersections or one of these two intersections. Um, 
there are a whole bunch of different tactics that, that we can employ that will make it easier to cross, that will slow cars down, that will make it safer for bikes. And so the idea is we can we test a bunch of these on this calm corridor. And then we get a feel for what do motorists like really complain about? Uh, what's better or worse for actually slowing cars down at intersections or, or getting cars to come to complete stops yeah. before they go or making pedestrians or cyclists more visible? And we can test the Remington pedestrian bike alley. You could test it for like a month and just see how, how it impacts traffic. That's really yep. That's good. Oh, okay. I just love that idea right there. And I, I live a block from Remington. I walk and bike everywhere. I don't like it. It's too narrow. I don't walk the sidewalk. It's too narrow. And I don't bike. It's just too narrow. I go to catch you. know, I never do any of that on them. And of course, it doesn't hurt me. I don't do it. I don't do anything with the bike. So that actually is right? Cool. Yeah, I'm just going to say that uh, I work over at CSEC on Gates right here. And we have two gates. And one of them is closed. They they have those little barricades come out of the ground, and so you can't drive, right? So it could be something. I really am not certain that we really will. But if we wanted to maybe the peak hours of when people commit to children on school, maybe we barricade Main and Remington, and it would at least prevent people from coming up and using it. Maybe eventually within our own you know cross streets, we know we're not drive, you know, we're not turn on shit. They do that in Paris, like the blocks surrounding the streets. Big Park City blocks off the six to seven the Union streets. Like Wednesdays and Sundays or something, they'll have other lives blocked. Yeah, the whole length of the street. Yeah. It's a big draw. Big Park Street. Main Street. We just have to make sure there's nobody like driving over top of them when they start coming out of the <laughs> <laughs> you know, of we have some that uh, you can lift in and out and yeah. probably that long. You can drive over the street. So. You had a question? Uh, and I just want to throw something that says this thing where the knife is a girl out there in the garage and just like that. Let me write that down. No, right. uh, confession? So, confession. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I did want to ask about was um, the change management strategy for this. Like, regardless of which streets end up getting identified as the optimal ones, I know, I know that there's a you know it's not, it's human nature, right? There's not much actually response to anything that's going to affect one's immediate vicinity. And yeah. I think just some thought that they. The increased use of bicycles. I think there's a lot of data, and you know, maybe some modeling that could help make the make the case a little bit more compelling. Is that that don't think it's critical. I think it's super important. You know, if you thought about, I think passing him to me is kind of just too broad. When I drive my one of my terrible children <laughs> from school, <laughs> um, it's not safe. There's idling that you could also quantify if you had. More people like you know there are, there are you know other kinds of health and safety improvements right but I'm also so I'm curious about like what what gets sort of be like what gets what gets measured gets managed right like what have we thought about at you know keeping it is there a running list of all of the minors and adults that have been injured by by motorists in that state do we need do we know what percent of our community or residents that use something with wheels you know all the time throughout the day. Like I think that seems like a really important part of the, the story that you mentioned sort of alerts me to the potential, you know, positive impact of having fewer cars in the, in the school because there'd be an incentive even for students to not use their parents' car. I also wonder how many families could have one car instead of two if they never drove their kid on whatever they almost never drove their kids to and from school, you know, because that also, and people in the room are going to tell me after that, that also could actually have a really tangible impact to benefit from that. And are we doing anything with the data? Like how we would think about quantifying the positive impact of what we're talking about? 
Well, we have we have data. You have a lot of different types of data points. We have great we have great traffic crash data. We have bike cyclist crash data, so we hit and resolve data for that. Um, we have volume data that we can point to. We don't have a good. Um, I don't know of a good quantification of how many people are using multimodal transportation on a regular basis in Bexley. And I'm not, that would be an interesting thing to try to extract from this. And I think in terms of change management, so this is like, you're here in the Petri dish of a change management experiment, which is um, all the letters, letters went out to everyone who lives on Cassingham, knowing that we're gonna talk about bike lanes. Um, we are talking about a school corridor, which is an excellent way to get talking about safety writ large in Bexley and how to be creative about our safety plan. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to talk about student safety and kid safety um, and to uh, sort of push for cultural change through that than it is to just like pick, you know, another corridor that you can't directly tie to this. So for us, this is a way to, um, everything you said is valid about data, but also just say like, pull a little bit on appropriate hard strings to say that this is yeah. but this is an opportunity for us to enhance safety and you know learn from the different sorts of tactics that we can use and then we have a case study it's a lot less scary when you say well you know look at what we did over here as much as the main street medians did cause some consternation you know we were able to actually there's data about that to show that we didn't actually change the traffic pattern on main street it might have calmed slowed it a little bit but people still had all the access to the same turns. And so that when we put meetings on Broad Street, we had that data and, and that example. So then Broad Street was literally no opposition. Main Street was some conversation. Broad Street was nothing because Main Street, we had appointment. Now we know people hit meetings on Broad Street a lot more than they do on Main Street. So we have a whole, we have a whole different set of information and challenges. So I think this is a great way to kind of move forward with some of these concepts, um, even as some of that data is getting gathered, if that makes sense. I think you raised another good point though too, which is collect data before we implement these specific yep. measures so that we can okay. know this is the impact that these measures have, and then we can feel good about rolling them out versus feels not as good. So we should do yeah. more of it. Hopefully there's that too. Yeah. Question. I love the idea of adding the bike lanes to Cassidy. Mm -hmm. Um, can you go into further detail what that means for the car? Yeah. So you mean driving cars? Those cars all in it? Yeah. So there would be no parked cars okay. uh, in that section. That's, that's ever. Just, that's ever. Just where if you do bike lanes. lanes. So if you do bike bike lanes in that's this. Yeah. This it's, section. So yeah, just all, all of the nothing parked, parked, yeah. really? Correct. So, so yeah, there's not enough room, room there to be sure with our castle. And let me explain a little bit of the fair. So just south of Bexley High School on Cassingham until you get Sherwood. Wow. Okay. No, no, we, so here's <laughs> we the challenge. Do, okay. And it, it, I mean, okay, so I'm reserved for more that I, oh, I, know, I, I know all the ways. I'm driving <laughs> into people's like carpool in the field. Yeah. But I don't dare drive up and down Cassingham because I see the bikes weaving mm -hmm. in and out of the bars. I see all the parked cars. I yeah. have not let my kids bikes middle school yet. Right. Because I don't feel like there's a safe route. So yeah, I hear that. And that's actually so there are a variety of interventions that you can perform. Bike lanes are a fantastic intervention for a cyclist when you have the space to do it and you have uh, the, the, the trade offs are acceptable. And so there's probably not agreement up here about what the trade offs are for bike lanes that are acceptable. But if we take away parking in the areas where parking is like, Vehicle, houses don't have access to guest parking other than in front of their house, which is not the case for Cassidy and South of Fair and the North of Maine, then um, that's a whole other level of conversation, right? And we don't physically have enough space to have parking and bike lanes and cars without, we actually literally don't have physical space. Some of our streets we do, but it would take out the trees, move the sidewalks further out. And it's, it would be a trade off that most people probably wouldn't be super happy about. Um, but we're like, I guess, so in my opinion, this is just my opinion, and you guys, please chime in with any counter opinions, but like our current approach is how can we surgically look at like areas where it does make sense, it is additive, it can happen with minimal trade-offs and sets kind of the tone and sets some examples. Another place we're looking at is Roosevelt between Fair and Maine. 
there's an interest and opportunity there as well. And there's some desire from those residents to calm the traffic. So bike lanes both slow down traffic because they narrow the street and they also provide a safer route for cyclists. The other place we're looking at is Maryland on Cassidy. So Maryland North on Cassidy. That would require some more radical reworking of the parking on Cassidy, but you can accommodate one side of parking on Cassidy potentially and two, two ways bike lanes and traffic. So those are some of the places like we're looking at. Can we do it? And and then we'll be able to talk more openly with residents about like, okay, if you really want bike lanes on your on your street and it makes sense, here are the trade-offs and is it something that can work for the community? Do you guys want to add anything to that? Because I, I no, I mean it's a good over. I think that strip is a good testing ground, you know, just to get people, you know, pros and cons, people used to it, and then you take that case study and see if it can apply apply other places. So yeah, if you look at the cities that have rolled out bicycle infrastructure like over the last 10 years in the US, oftentimes it starts small and then you have success there and you scale up. And I think the same thing here. Part of what we're looking at with this is um, the ultimate safest state is a separated protected bike lane. But there's a lot of challenges with that. We just don't have wide enough streets in almost every scenario. So then what is the best option kind of given what we have? And also we're, I, we're kind of leaning towards the carrot here as opposed to the stick, because there are things that you could do. Like you could put in a protected bike lane and remove parking and make streets one way streets. And a lot of people would be really happy with that. And so like, what's the happy medium that, that does create this safe environment for cycling and walking without taking away much from, from other, other residents who are worried about storing their cars in the street. In the current sector, it doesn't have, I know. Are you talking about these parking it's, and motors? It's just in general, the in street sector. Drexel was, not to bring up a sort of topic, Drexel was wide enough to accommodate one side of parking, bike lanes. I think we did one side of parking, bike lanes, and traffic. Yeah, but none of the streets could accommodate parking on both sides of the bike. No, not that I'm aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were concerns. There's I don't want to get addressed. There are concerns yeah. about that, so that arrangement and why that might not be safe in some in some degree. Yeah. But I think we, we talked about the potential drawback to one-way streets. But if we had a one-way street and there were cars parked there and a, you know, that, that those parked cars can provide the protection for the bike lane. Uh, which is a good or thing. or a bike lane like in the in that strip right so then you have a, a lane for driving and a protected lane if you could do that and it's a one way that would be a, another solution and we're I mean I gotta say we're luck, luck we are solving a problem and that's good I think in generally enhancing safety but we also have generally we do have we're benefiting from having slower streets we're benefiting from generally having a grid that we can work off and, and it's a good canvas to work from which is you know well i mean i guess it's, it's uh, two part too i'm still just thinking about chat because it's in some ways the one has the park cars benefit us because we can slow down the traffic but have we also ever thought about like making park cars move during this school like no park cars on Cassidy and during 7.30, you know, so it means people won't have to wake up and call on. I mean, if you want to present to the neighbors on South Cassidy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great, it's a very creative solution. Uh -huh. It's a, that's yeah. not off the, not off the table. It's an option. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I do, I think you're, you. Trish, I think you're a good deal about character. You could probably make it happen. No, I mean, if you think about your main street, I'm, no, I'm, I'm parking, right? Yeah, right. And but really, only because, like, I think I, I came here tonight because I still feel like the school zone. I don't think casting a com complex, especially, is it's bananas. It is bananas. We, I, we, I, I agree with you. Yeah. About and that. and then and I hate also. It sounds crazy. Buses factored into it are nuts. Like we, it would be so much more ideal to have a dedicated bus area that does not interfere with traffic, whether it means like it's We're not coming up traffic in the way it does. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some some schools. Uh, yeah. yeah, there are some schools that have had success with the immediate surrounding streets not having vehicular traffic. Um, yeah. you know, it's just for people walking or biking to school. And then if you do want to drop off in a car, you can do it from a block away and it's, yeah. you're still very close, but yeah, not the immediate one. Just that hour where you are, where you're kidding off. Mm -hmm. I personally, I personally off. love that. Yeah. Um, but that's one of those carrot versus stick things. That's a stick and people who want to drive their kids and drop them right in front, it's super inconvenient. But um, maybe it's just inconvenient enough that you walk your kid to school a block and a half instead of um, driving them at a rate where they have managed to drive their kids like literally, well, some of them less than a block to Maryland every single road trip. <laughs> Mind blown. He names some names real quick. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Eric's got a clipboard. He'll, uh -huh. he'll watch you. Yeah. No, I've got a long list up here. <laughs> so it's all just, it's conceptual. Let's talk about next steps. Um, so right now it is conceptual when it kind of socialize some ideas, just get some of this feedback, which has like been really helpful. Um, the next step is we would work with go back to our traffic engineers and start talking a little bit more about specific. I thought, I mean, uh, Craig did a great job of showing some specific treatments for specific intersections. Come up with a proposal and then pitch that back to the community. And um, there's a lot of asterisks in terms of like, how does storm infrastructure work with this? Because that can be a big dollar amount. How do, uh, you know, how does some of the traffic engineering concerns get assuaged? But I would love to see this be a 2024 project um, with even a possibility that some of it maybe happens in 23 because very limited amount. Uh, Cassingham, Denver is getting repaved this summer. So there might be some opportunity to work on that. So um, then obviously like anything that's gonna impact somebody's parking pattern gets noticed to those residents so they have a chance to have feedback. So. It's a fluid sort of like develop the concept more, more solidly, gather some more information, provide better exhibits to show what we're talking about, communicate back to the stakeholders, get more feedback. And then we're timing this, hoping that we can put some of it in place next, next uh, spring, summer. But one, one thing that we talked about earlier was the bike boulevards and the signage for those. That's a hope for 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we've got to solidify some of it, yes. Every time we meet, the bike boulevards change. So we need to really like figure out where are these bike boulevards, but we're getting there. Yeah, and those would connect to some of these possible ideas that we talked about tonight on the corridor. And those are primarily signage. That's not infrastructure. Yeah, yeah it's signage, it's yeah, designation and making people feel maybe a little more comfortable sharing, sharing the traffic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to say I really appreciate all of your guys' work and all the classes this for our children, for our whole community. I know it's not something that we have to do. Well, one of us is just, no, but you guys are. Thank you. That's, no, that's, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for saying uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to second that. Uh, we live on South Castle Hill, right across from Castle Hill Elementary School. Uh, love the idea of a raised um, tabletop. Yeah. Tabletop. tabletop. Um, the, the, what's it, the cross pattern? Scramble yeah, intersection. Uh -huh. uh, those ideas seem great to me. Generally, that intersection we feel with our kids crossing it, but in good safety. We love the five second delay yeah. uh, on the lights. We have friends from other neighborhoods who came to visit and they were like, you guys have that? <laughs> <laughs> when it's rained, you can just take it off. Um, so we love a lot of the things. That was three years of fights, by the way, with traffic yeah. engineers. I just want you to know that. <laughs> so, on main main broad, not so much. Are you talking about the tabletop at Elm and Castle? Yeah. That intersection? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. We live right there. Um, love that idea that I drive down the road and parkour sometimes where the little bump out is, it works. Yeah. And you can slow down. How do you feel about losing your parking? Are you cool with that? So that's I'm just joking. Uh, no, 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 yeah. yes, but, uh, yeah. We don't have guest parking in front of our house to lose in front of Castle Hill Elementary. That was a you know change. Um, yeah. The people would be both allowed to have a park. Um, you know, yeah. Of the so 
but it is so there's no bike lane plan for where he's at, so he wouldn't be impacted. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But but I do agree. Uh, it is the one that creates a lot of yeah. Cars dropping off, sliding, there's lots of a lot of bike lanes. Um, it's it, yeah. I'm reticent. Yeah, and I'm reticent to get too specific into the schools, specifically campus, without having the schools present for the meeting. Um, I will say we have a couple things that we are working on in terms of driver education and signage. I think that it's gone. This past year feels to me different. It's gotten a little more crazy than normal. And so um, specifically around intersections, we're going to be starting to do a very obvious kind of uh, in their face education campaign about like not pulling in the middle of the intersection when the kids off right in front of crosswalks where the drivers are distracted, some other stuff that's mo most most obvious. Um there's a there's a lot to be said about the school campus I think so for sure. Well I think speaking of schools too there's also I've seen many comments earlier an education component for the students. Um, yeah so some kids um, ride bikes a lot have parents who ride bikes and coach them and, and others don't. And so I think, especially as we get to the point where Palm Corridor becomes real, educate the kids on how to use the Palm Corridor and, and how to be a good cyclist too. Like I don't want to victim blame cyclists, um, but we can like we can get better as well uh, and be safer. And part of that, I think you were mentioning taking the lane. Um, yeah, that's one of those things that like a strategy that especially when the road is tight uh it's safer to take the lane than try and ride over where the car thinks they can speed by uh and they they go for it uh, mm -hmm. but there's that education for the students as well yep. i didn't know about the um like how i actually like yeah i see much smaller than but um Probably four, four years ago, and um, our our kids that rode the bike, kids going north and down, would actually ride the bike from down, and they then walk to the front of the sidewalk to the bike lane. And then four years ago, when this whole person came, we had all. First off, I'd like to do a shout out to Mrs. Warnicky because she was like the uh, she she ruled with uh, great passion and love, um, and I would imagine. Yeah, I'll pass that along to I'll, I'll pass it along to the schools and to the uh, PTO of Montrose. And... That's a good point. Well, that speaks even to like a bigger issue here too is if it's not safe for kids to ride in the street, they ride on the sidewalks and they ride fast on the sidewalks and you don't hear them coming behind you and your dog goes over your kid, your Three year olds. It's just so we need to make it safe for kids to be able to ride in streets um, and for cars to be super aware that they need to have their eyes open, they need to go slow, they need to be ready to stop. Any last last questions, last thoughts? Okay. Thanks so much, guys, for coming. Um, we'll keep you updated. If you have not signed up for the Bexley Blast, we'll be doing updates via the Blast, Bexley.org slash Blast. Or follow Eric Bjornyard on social media.